and take out, you know, the water breaks, et cetera, you have like five to six minutes for each activity. Well, what can you get done in five or six minutes? Even if it's a great drill, we don't like the word drill, but even if it's a great drill, what can you do in five or six minutes? How many, how many opportunities do the kids have to actually practice whatever you're practicing? And then we look at, well, what exactly are you practicing? So in this program, what I've done is <clears throat> I've set up um, six categories, hence the six elements for, now the, the title is really important. I'm not saying six elements that will make your practices hum and everything you do will be perfect. And by the end of the season, you will vault from seventh place to second place. The performance part of it needs to be set aside. I'm not interested, nor should you be interested. You, you know, Joe coach or Josephine coach. So the six elements are fun, decision-making, game-like, competitive, challenging, and fitness. So for each category, I present the coaches with what is research telling us in hockey and in soccer about the hockey is I'm sure you guys who are, you know, all hockey ex experts for decades will agree of all the team sports in the world. Hockey is by far the most challenging to coach by far. The only one that perhaps comes close is Buskashi. For those of you who don't know what Buskashi is, it's the national sport of Afghanistan. It's played on horseback, and you get about 40 people running at each other on horseback, picking up the headless carcass of a goat or a sheep and trying to carry it, weigh like 90 pounds, and throw it into a circle. I, I've seen Buskashi on, on YouTube. I haven't seen any referees because they'd probably be run over and killed. It does sound from like hockey. It, it is in the, in the old Federal League, Tim. Uh, or in slap shot, right. So aside from Buskashi, hockey is the most challenging sport, but we don't provide coaches with tools. So in this presentation, I am providing them the information. You cannot, as, as a former teacher and a teacher of adults, you cannot, you, you, you have to take the classic storytelling technique of show versus tell. You tell coaches to do something, they're not going to do it. Well, listen, I didn't do it that way when I was in midget or in junior, or I watched that junior team practice, or I've been going on various websites and all these major junior and pro coaches are saying, I do this and I do that. Our world in minor hockey is light years apart from the being on the ice daily world of junior, whether it's junior. I mean, I remember my last group in junior in Montreal, in Ottawa, uh, we were on the ice every day. I could not convince the owner slash GM we needed to take a break. We weren't a good team to begin with. We were on the ice every day. But the opportunities to do things with those players was enormous. If I wanted to work on sharp turns, I didn't. But if I wanted to work on sharp turns, I could have done it. We we did tons of stuff. and, and But, you know, minor hockey coaches have two a week, maybe one a week maybe three a week if they get into playoffs and they, they go deep. So their opportunities are limited. Their knowledge is limited. Their skills are limited. Their backgrounds in coaching and teaching are uh, limited. So I provide them the information. And then I say to the coaches or to the organization, all right, if you want to take this further, let's go further with it. Contact me. We'll look at a, a partnership in, in mentoring. But first, I have to provide you some tools. So I've done deep dives into books like this. I don't know if you've read this. Rob Gray, good Canadian boy teaching at, uh, at Arizona State University. And then there's this one. Joe Baker teaches at York University. Tyranny of Talent. I love the title. There, there's a whole bunch of things that coaches need to look at, look at but they won't. Why? Life gets in the way. So I go, all right, I'll look at it. I will take snippets out of these sources and all the, the research docs that you can find online under Google Scholar or wherever, and I will provide you the information. So let's look at the first one, fun. Well, fun is easy. If it's not fun in practice, 
then how, you know, in, in USA hockey, they, they started that American development model. And I think it was 2009. And the basic reason was because of a retention problem. And if you talk to Bob Mancini, which I have and Roger Grillo, which I, I think Roger has been on this, this call, um, the USA Hockey looked at it and went, well, wait a second, time out. We're losing our kids. You know, in the USA, you have basketball and football and golf and baseball and all these other sports that have heavy influences culturally. And hockey, we're losing our kids. How do we keep them in? we got to make it more fun. And as Bob Mancini said on some other enemy podcast a few months ago, um, we got to take the outdoor game and bring it indoors. So fun. There are two ladies in in um, in USA Hockey or affiliated with USA Hockey, Amanda Visick and Heather Mannix, who did a really cool study about two years ago, I think, on fun. Their conclusion, without getting into all the bits and pieces, was that regardless of age, regardless of level of play, and regardless of gender, all participants in hockey want to have fun. Now, what they determine as fun is you know, somewhat variable, but they want fun. So if we want to keep the game, the kids in the game, we, we've got to have a, a huge fun and components. So then I go on to other things like decision-making. This is a huge one. Everything we do in practice should involve, I, I don't feel, I don't want you guys to feel like I'm preaching. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm informing you what I give to the coaches. Okay. Um, everything we do in, in, in a practice should involve decisions. If we want our players to make good decisions in games, obviously we have to do stuff in practice that forces them to do, make good decisions. So I provide the coaches with some of the research on that. A lot of it is coming from soccer, but some of it is also coming from hockey. Um, as soon as you put, I'll, I'll come back to the toys on the ice. Let me come back to that because that involves decision-making. Um, I show some videos in the presentation from stuff I've taken out here of kids participating in drills, activities, whatever you want to call them, where I ask the coaches, all right, watch this, observe, because the, pow the power of observation is crucial. So you know, somebody said to me, I met with these guys in this organization last Friday night. I stayed, we, we were at, at this place having beer and wings till nearly two o'clock in the morning. Imagine hockey people talking for three hours, go figure. Uh, and... <clears throat> Um, and I said, watch these videos. What do you see? What do you observe? One guy who'd been on, just been on the ice in practice said, well, I was running a drill. And I said, Tony, why didn't you stand off to the side and watch the drill? Observe it. Well, I had to run it. I said, you couldn't give your assistant coach the pucks to flip into the corner while you stood off to observe your kids. We don't watch enough. Yogi Berra was right. You can observe a lot by watching. So I showed them a couple of drills and I, on video and I said, right, what do you see? What are the coaches doing? What are the players doing? What's the feedback? What's the interaction? What's the nature of the communication? What constraints are there in the approach, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and then we go into, into a little bit of what the research says, you know, that small sided games are more effective for learning skills than drills because our coaches are not equipped to teach the skills anyway. Like my background is technical. I worked with Gaston Marcotte in Montreal. I don't know if you guys know that name, but the Russians used to consider him the top technician in the world. Uh, worked with Howie Meeker in Montreal. Well, it was only one day, but still. So my, my background is technical. So for years, I was doing the technical stuff. Turns out it was wrong. At that time, it was right. I see now, no, don't do it. So I've seen coaches take kids on the ice and practice uh, stuff with, you know, things on the ice and, and showing them tight turns and, and they're not teaching. They're just running them through drills. They're drilling. Then I go into game like uh, research study out of um, a guy named Igor Andreevich, or I think is his name. D uh, Dean Holden knows the name. He knows the guy who did a study about 12, 13 years ago that 90% of the hockey that, that occurs at pretty much every level, but his study was based on junior was in twos and threes. 45% of the game was in one against one. So I show a clip of uh, players or, uh, you know, in a, in a game 
and ask the coaches, what do you see? They're not in clumps of fours and fives. You know, basically, the game is played in twos and threes, sometimes fours, two against one, one against two, three against oh. So if that's the way the game is played and we accept that, we agree with that, then how does that inform what we do in practice? Shouldn't our practice, shouldn't our games reflect what we've done in practice, practice the game? We all know that because we've been around the game since Morenz was a kid. So we know that the coaches don't. We have to inform them. So I go into game like, and I give a couple of examples of, of drills, exercises, games you can play. And if you do this game, what happens? Well, I did, the, did a conference last year, last June, uh, uh, the dean was at here in Whitby uh, with a girls program. And we ran coaches through some ice sessions where they did some of these things. They were astounded how difficult they were in a simple one against one game. The other thing I learned from doing that conference, and I've done a few of these, I did one in Oshawa in 2018 and one here in Whitby last summer. Um, It's a, if you build it, they will come. Coaches want to learn. Like there was no certification for these conferences. 30 coaches in an association with 18 teams attended this conference. And in Oshawa, the same thing. Why? It's not because I'm an ex-NHL and I'm going to show off Stanley Cup rings. I don't have that. It's not because I'm I'm a captivating personality. Well, you know, but they came because there was information that they could, they felt that they could take. They wanted to become better. Adults want to become better. How do they become better? In my view, it's up to the likes of me. And, and you guys to, to provide that to them. Then I go into competitive, which is the third one on the, on the list. And I provide them the uh, YouTube link to um, uh, Zach Nowak's presentation he did a couple of years ago for USA Hockey, um, talking about, you know, what we can learn through, through games. Bob Mancini had a great, I keep going back to the American guys because the Canadian guys aren't doing anything. So Bob Mancini had a great, six minute video on the OMHA site last fall talking about how the game is chaos and our practices should reflect it. And it was fantastic messaging, but um, what's the follow-up? What does that mean? How do coaches apply it? What should they do? What shouldn't they do? Um, So I go into in the competitive one, uh, what's a good game design and game is in quotation marks. How do you determine game? So some of this I've, I've just stolen with Dean's permission from Dean Holden. Um, what constitutes proper games? What are the constraints? What should you do? What shouldn't you do? Why would you put in constraints? Uh, what is it leading to? Um, and then I go to um, from competitive to challenging and the constraints led approach. And I, I'm very cognizant of not throwing too much terminology at coaches, uh, but in the presentation, I actually give them a handout with all the definitions. So I don't want to put definitions up on a slide. They've all graduated grade six. They can all read. So I'm not going to put that up on the slide, but I, they'll have a handout. And I say, all right, look, read your handout on your own time, whenever. Here's what constraints mean. They're rules. They're limitations. If you're going to play two against two, why are you doing it? What are the rules around it? Are you going to use a yellow puck or a green puck or a red puck? You know, which all might mean something different. Uh, and why would you do it? What is it you're trying? What's the big message you're trying to get across? I should have started out by saying the I start the presentation with um, what are the four roles in hockey? You know, uh, play with the puck, play near the puck or supporting the puck, play defensive play. You know, you know what the four roles. I don't have to go into that. So I go into the challenging part. I show them uh, some photos of taken from Rob Gray's book. Um, he teaches at Arizona State of Mike Trout, the baseball player, hitting, uh, hitting, uh, two different stances, and then I show pictures of I'm a Montrealer, Cole Caulfield in Montreal taking a one-timer shot, <clears throat> and look at the you know you coaches, what do you observe? What are the differences here? What do you see? So research is telling us that there are no two things that you do that are alike at any time, basically. 
Like you can hammer a nail, you know, 50 times. And every time you strike it, there'll be a different angle of your arm to your wrist to your, you know, and so on and so on. Then we get into the challenging with on ice toys, which will be the, the contentious one. <clears throat> if you want your kids to make good decisions, remove the toys. Or as Adam Oates says, get the toys off the ice, all of them. He said that on a podcast a couple of years ago. Get the toys off the ice. Um, the, the skills development instructors and Hockey Canada has to take some responsibility for this disease we've got all over the place. Every skills instructor is the best in the world. They come floating in at 250 bucks an hour to teams. They take up, you know, we're going to use the skills instructor for 30 minutes. They're going to roll the pylons. They're going to jump over plastic sticks. And uh, now they'll be better. And they aren't. You ask the coaches, are your kids better? No. Well, I don't know. Maybe they turn a little bit better. But can they play better? Um, I haven't seen it. So we're teaching technique, but not skill. There's no application. There's no learning that's taking place basically is, is the problem. So I go into a little bit about the ask questions, you know, very Socratic approach. Uh, who's making the decisions on where to go and why with, with the toys? What's the player looking at? Who's, what are the decisions that are being made? How many reps? What's the variability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I talk a little bit about the forgetting curve. If you do something for 20 minutes of practice once a week, they're going to forget it, you know, within a day. Um, and that's, and the last one is fitness. And here I've stolen unabashedly from a guy named Raymond Verheyen. I think I've pronounced it right. Who's a Dutch soccer researcher. He's going to be on my podcast next week, Dean and I are having him on, um, who talks about fitness for, he says, football. I've substituted hockey. Fitness in hockey versus fitness for hockey that we get very focused on getting the kids in shape in season, which of course you can't do, um, as opposed to having practices that, again, the word hum, go, 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 go. Um, let's play lots of games, uh, various types for various reasons, and the fitness will come from that. But the coaches don't know aerobic versus anaerobic. They've never heard those terms. They don't know their application. You know, and then they're thinking, well, I have uh, nine forwards on my team and six defensemen, and I'm going to do what the junior teams do. Well, wait a second, time out. Junior teams have four lines of 19-year-olds who've been playing competitive hockey since they were eight. You've got three lines of 12-year-olds who have play been playing tier one, you know, or four competitive hockey for two years. You can't compare them. It's like comparing grade six with your first year university. You can't. Can't compare them. That's it. That's basically it. So this is what the like the slide looks like for. I don't, can you see that? Let me get that in front of the camera. So no, well, that's not right. No, there we go. I don't know if you can share your screen. Oh, uh, maybe I should do that. That makes even more sense. Yeah. Give it a whirl. I'd like to see if that yeah. works. Um, uh, hold on. Okay. I put up a question earlier when you were talking, Richard, but yeah, uh, I'm not sure where to go with this. Um, but no, Richard's know. created this program, and I think every one of us has worked with in the way we work with the programs that we. We're working with them, trying to do the programs they've been given. And uh, it's a little bit different. It's uh, I personally feel really awkward in the role of mentorship anymore. Can you see that? So I'm, uh, you know, I'm at a loss right now of where to go in the process of trying mm -hmm. to um, contribute a little bit uh, wherever I can. But. Anyway, uh, uh, we're, I, we're looking at your Gmail, Richard. Oh, you can't see that? No. Uh, looking at my Gmail. Gmail won't, no. My Gmail won't help you. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, hold on. <clears throat> uh, view tab. Oh, we don't want that one. No. Stop sharing that one. Okay. The share screen uh let's try this one chrome tab 
Uh, oh, there we go. That one. There. Yes. Can you see that? No. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Richard. So it starts with. Richard, yes. before you begin, I wonder if yeah. anybody's got a question at this point about what you've talked about an or an observation relative to where they're coming from in their environments of mentorship over their years. <clears throat> Peter Whitney, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, one of the things you talked about, Richard, uh, about the skills coaches and teaching the, the various things, you know, jumping over the sticks, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think it's up to the coaches, and maybe this is part of what you do, is is teach them how to learn those things with their kids and where and how do we apply those in a game right the, the if the skills coach is teaching them uh to learn let's say a mohawk mohawk turn mohawk move apply that in a practice so they understand that they use it to gain space maybe along a wall in order to do uh as a defender recover use the net mohawk so you can face up ice to make a play so I think the skills are good. I think the kids need those, but I think it's it's up to the coaches to understand how, in fact, they can incorporate those into their practices so that the kids can have a practical application. And certainly a good skill instructor, I think, will share that with whomever they're working with. You know, here's here's what we do here and here's why we do that. Here's how you can use it in a game. So I think the skills part is good and is important, um, but I think it's also important to find good coaches who can apply it in their practices. The the research, uh, well, first of all, coaches are ill-equipped. Uh, I have found, and I've seen a great many of these skills people, um, they're really ill-equipped to even follow up effectively. So they need to be taught that. So I agree there. The problem is that we, we want them to learn to play the game. And the breaking it down into, here's how you do a mohawk. I don't even know if that's politically correct anymore. But um, learning how to do a mohawk or any other type of, of skill, isolated from all the other things they need to be able to do in a game, is being shown in various research documents I have found to be ineffective. It's actually counterproductive. The kids are not learning. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with teaching games for understanding, TGFU. Are you familiar with that at all? I mean, I, I've heard the term and, uh, you know, you used small games and so right. we, we call them small area competitions because yep. I kind of like the way that sounds a little better. But Well, TGFU began in Britain in the early 80s. It's a physical education term when they found that kids were not taking phys ed classes in high school. So they decided to, because they were teaching skills, they were breaking it down into, into skills and the kids were turned off. So they, they were bored. So they stopped taking classes. So they came up with this gamified, I guess, approach, you could call it, um, called uh, teaching games for understanding. So they, have, you know, hockey is an invasion sport. They have different types of sports, <laughs> hockey, soccer, uh, lacrosse, all under the, umbrella of invasion sports and they found that by putting the kids in a, in a, a game type environment they were more likely to try to uh to apply skills and that you could correct them as they go along so there's a whole art to um uh you know doing an activity taking the kids who have trouble doing a different certain type of turn and and you know providing them some instruction and that on the side but not. St I saw a junior team out here where the assistant coach who was a skills instructor, the girls that were 17 years old, they're junior level girls. So they're pretty skilled. And they were doing a warm-up drill. I didn't like the warm-up drill, but anyway, they, they did a warm-up drill. <clears throat> and after four girls had done it, he stopped the drill and was teaching them how to hold their stick because he didn't like the way they were holding their sticks. And the girls are standing there for maybe a minute, minute and a half, which is a long time listening to this guy preach to them how to hold a stick. I talked to the head coach afterwards. He said, why didn't you just tell to, uh, uh, Johnny to, you know, talk to the girls who weren't holding the stick properly on the side and, you know, work with them that way instead of stopping the whole team after only four reps out of 17. 
He said, oh, no, you can't do that. You shouldn't even learn how to hold the stick properly. I said, well, yeah, agreed, but <laughs> you have to stop the whole team to do it. You know, that kind of old, old-fashioned approach. Coaches only have two practices a week. In house they have one practice a week. So taking the time out to show them how to do a particular skill, you said a Mohawk turn, a certain kind of shot. Who has time to do that? Shouldn't we learn, get them to learn how to, how to play the game? And then embed the instruction with another coach on the side. I'm just showing you some of the slides here that can you guys see these okay? Yep. Yeah. 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 So decision making, game like. This is the presentation from uh, Zach Nowak. <clears throat> I know I'm racing through this because I only have a few more minutes. I got to take care of a baby. Um, how to create purposeful games. We're, it seems to me that we're, we've been very stuck for a very long time in an approach that has not proven to be very successful in practice. Um, like I've used a, a game type approach. All my drills or activities when I was actively coaching were very competitive and very challenging and coach, players often complained that they were too hard. But everything... Everything is e is hard until it becomes easy. Um, there's the one about Mike Trout. There's Cole Caulfield. So the coaches observe that. And what do you see as the difference in the shooting technique? Appreciate you giving me the time here, Wally, to... Uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir for the most part, I think. <laughs> that coming from me? Uh, sorry, I just, I like just phone. Phone. No, that's that's okay. Wally's phone. Oh, okay. <laughs> a familiar, a familiar tune to us. What's a what a great <laughs> ringtone? Yeah. He pays a thousand a week for it. <laughs> then there's this. That's where we all end up anyway. Yep. Richard, I'm going to uh, throw a curveball at you. Sure. Um, I observed Tom's practice last night and Wes's they shared ice. <clears throat> and I look at the words you have with the SEAP program. And I would give the both of them, if I was evaluating their practice, high scores out of 10 in terms of what they did in those words alone. Okay. But what I didn't, what, what bothered me because I'm a creature of habit. Right. I didn't see important details of habit occur. Okay. <clears throat> For instance, they, they all did uh, Tom's group did half ice stops and starts. The other group did whole ice stops and starts. Now, I observed over six players on each team stop and face the same way. Now, that's a habit. Yep. So I'm saying the intervention of that particular tactical habit is something for me I have to address and if I can't address it I can't watch it and I watched it with the Calgary Flames at a lightning drill I got to talk to Marty Jelena who was on the ice at the time when they did a conditioning bag skate and again six players stopped on their favorite side, that's a bad habit. And I brought it up, and Marty, at two practices later that I observed, made the area smaller, coaches stood on one side, 
and they stopped and start fading the, facing the right way. Now the details of stopping and starting, it was a crossover stop and start. Now I'm a detail guy. So I'm one of those habit guys. I wouldn't take one person to the side. I would practice it with everybody to appreciate the importance of that skill. So with Tom's team, they have a habit of stopping on a favorite side and they don't stop and de-start, they stop and cross over. And the same with Wes. And it's fundamental to learning how to stop and start. It's a starting point. Well, there are they when they're doing that. I mean, I, what the pros do, I'm not even going to touch that. Um, I've seen coaches do that same thing. I don't know why they do it, but they say we're practicing stops and starts. Well, what you're doing is practicing what the what the kids are doing is practicing what they can already not do, because there's no correction. No, it, it it it's all for conditioning. There is no purpose no. other than the fitness component. All right. So in the fitness component, why are we doing stops and starts for a minute or two minutes or four well, minutes? Well, I, you know? there's a thousand questions to right, that. right, exactly. and we know answers of doing it differently. Right. But right now, Tom's a high level coach. Right. West Jardine is there. I'm working with both of them. Right. And to stop them and bring up the point. Have them stop and face the same way as a matter of practice. I'm acting as a mentor, and I can't do that. How often in a game does somebody actually do a two-foot stop in a shift? Well, I'm aware of that. You know, right? I obviously the coaches I'm talking to aren't aware of that. Right? They don't know what they don't know, right. and I can't talk to them about it. Mm -hmm. So I'm. I would, I, I would say the answer to that is. All the time, but What's it's that? not it's not necessarily the most effective, efficient way to stop. Mm -hmm. But two foot stops happen all the time. Well, and it's funny you, you, the correct sorry. choice, and sometimes they're not. There are no absolutes in hockey. Right. I would say, right. Sorry, Wally. No, that that's a good point. Um, but I'm thinking, Tim, the habit of always facing the puck is without when you don't have the puck you want to see the ice you you it's a habit and that's that's what i'm getting at my frustration with coaches is strictly in the teaching of the elements yes that you appear to be brushing off so they can just play and learn by trial and error which i'm beginning to uh, agree to so I have to stop being so anal about individual skills. Like Tom is working on his assignment there. <laughs> and he's, he's the guy that I'm watching the practice of where I tried to interrupt the drill and bring up a point. And it's not important enough to them given what they're doing. Well, so, they were stopping and starting their gambling whether a guy scored or not, and just going back and forth. It wasn't really. No, that wasn't the primary was, purpose of it. They were scoring. It was a punishment for, not a punishment, but it was a fun thing that if they guessed wrong, they had to skate back and forth. So the, I wasn't even watching their technique. So the habit isn't that important for the the technique, and that's the point. The purpose, well, Rich. Right there, it was insignificant. You know, no, but the thing was they were gambling and we we're having a little bit of fun. Yeah. You know, it was a gambling shootout. Okay, I guess that's what I'm saying. They had fun. It went well. But in terms of my approach to watching things, I would interrupt it because that's important too. But according to Richard and Tom, I don't think interruption adds to the fun. Or the condition. Well, we could have said, we could have said, make sure you face that end when you stop. It just yeah. never even occurred to me. I mean, yeah. there, when, you know, Wally, you said that you're anal about the technical. I don't, I don't know who's more anal, you or me, having done this for years and years and years of 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 looking at a kid doing something and going, well, shouldn't their head be this or their arms be that or their feet like, and um, 
in the in the context of a hockey practice, it's really difficult to teach it. Um, if if coaches are provided certain tools to learn, well, okay, what are the technical parts of a tight turn? And they all say, well, hold the stick. Well, no, it's the head. But anyway, that's a whole other problem. Um, <clears throat> You can put constraints, rules, limitations, whatever you want to call it, in, in an activity that forces them to stop a certain way. Have an assistant coach or a head coach on the side to discuss with the kid or show the kid before their next turn. Here's what you got to do with your feet. What I'm suggesting is, and what, and I'm, it's not coming from me. I'm doing, I'm the face of, of all this research, I guess, is that, um, uh, breaking down the skills in practice and trying to teach them, you know, with all the toys on the ice or even without the toys on the ice, just using the dots and lines is actually counterproductive. And I've seen it myself. Like that's a lot of practices I've seen in three organizations over the last six years. It's astounding when I ask coaches afterwards, what are they better at? Yeah. Uh, and what do they do in games? How do they apply it in games? We're trying to get the kids to learn to play the game. Yeah, I, I would, I would obviously, Richard, you got to go. I'd love to have a longer discussion about this, and maybe yeah. the, yeah. maybe the five of us will when when you jump off. But sure. you know, like, doesn't the current state of the game? And I'm not talking necessarily. Well, at the NHL level, yes, but at every level, down to you can say Bantam even, or Pee Wee, the current state of the game, everybody skates better yes. than they did 35, 40 years ago. Every Five years ago. <laughs> everybody shoots yeah. better. Right. Everybody can handle the puck better. Right. So in some ways, is that not evidence that specific skill acquisition and development does work because that's been the whole focus in the game the last 15 years. And where I'm going is where I always go. It's not one way or the other way. Right. It, it needs to be a blend and a, and a combination. And I'm one that like, how do you, how do you, you apply a skill as a player if you don't know how to execute that skill? Some specific skill development, I think, is helpful, useful, and productive. And I would love to know how researchers prove that that's not the case when it seems self-evident where the game is now. Like, there is not a player in the NHL who you can point to and say, that guy's a poor skater. And 40 years ago when I played, there would be five, six, or seven players on every team. And it's partly because there's way more specific skill, practice, and ex uh, acquisition, I would argue. So it's a, it's a complex thing. Yeah, and I, I, I do have to jump off here, but um, I mean, it's, it's somewhat anecdotal, what, you know, the, the, the approach we're, we're talking about. Um, we do tend to fall back to the higher levels and what, you know, the higher level kids, even the lower level, higher level kids, I don't know if that makes sense, but mm -hmm. the lower level, higher level kids, uh, they're, they're on the ice six times a week. They're in summer hockey all, you know, constantly. Um, they just, they just keep going and going and going and going. The, the coaching is not necessarily better. The instructors are not necessarily better. But, you know, over the years that I've coached at every level up, you know, that, uh, you know, through to junior and college that um, uh, the players who are more motivated, you know, maybe, but you, the typical house league coach, the kids are just as weak. The tier two, three, four, five competitive level players are still just as weak. Their knowledge of the ability to play is still just as bad. But what do we see? We see the best kids. We, we make that comparison. I, there's no, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer here. I'm not even suggesting that, that a, a game type, again, in air quotes, type approach is the way to go thoroughly. Like if you talk to Dean Holden, the whole thing would be game 
game type, and he and I have discussed this. What I'm saying is that we have to train our coaches to be aware of how, um, uh, what is the role of technique versus skill? Skill is the application of technique. Is it happening in games? Girls hockey is a mess out here. 19% of the girls hockey players in the world are in Ontario. The girls that I saw the last two years working in an organization here, you know, they've, they're being taught to push the puck with one hand on the stick. They can't stick handle for their lives. Are they better? The best kids are better because they're on the ice six times a week and go to two months of hockey schools and spring hockey. So anyway, I, I just interject I, something here. Sure. Horse wine did all, you know, he field hockey and soccer. He set up the program for Barcelona and everything. And, and about teaching the skills, what he did is you create a need to know. So you have a game that maybe you have to make all your passes with your left foot. And then the, then the kids, be struggling because they don't have the skill. Then you have some you call them corrective exercises, where you you work on the technique of how you how you do that skill. Then you go back to the game again, you know that they've got, you know that they've got the proper technique, and that that's his process. You always create a need to know, because if you're just teaching things and kids or anybody doesn't even know why they're doing it. There's not much focus, but if you're frustrated, you don't know how to do something, someone gives you a few ideas, and that that's basically his uh, premise. Hey, I, I, I'm sorry, guys. I have, There's a baby that I have to <laughs> take care of, feed, change diaper, and um, I, I appreciate the time, Wally. I'll try to jump on again in, in the future. Um, okay, well, give, I've got... Give, them my, give, the, give everybody my email address, and, you know, we, let's get into a a conversation. Love to hear what the feedback is. Hello, Hal. How the heck are you? Uh, I'm good. Oh, Hal, I'm, uh, I record this, so the conversation yeah. after okay. is going to be the conversation that matters the most because you're talking to experts, mm -hmm. so-called we are, mm. who are still trying to learn about what the hell's the right way to do things. Yeah. Right. And I'm not sure I know at all. I feel dumber than ever right now. <laughs> and so my, mm. my conversations for the rest of the day is more in keeping with your approach and actually Hockey Canada's station and game like approach. And depends what's in it, depends what's going oh, on in the oh, station. Let, let me finish. Yeah. I'm watching one coach live by the Hockey Canada model of three mm. skill stations mm -hmm. with great reputation. Mm -hmm. Are they proper and accurate? No, but there's activity, fitness. And then when they combined with Tom last night, they played a whole ice game and they mm -hmm. played some competitive games. They had fun. Mm -hmm. The practice would score a night out of 10 on every one of your points. Mm -hmm. It's just for me, I wouldn't give it a 9 out of 10 because I'm a teaching asshole. <laughs> no, and I'm serious. Yeah. yeah. So Richard's point, uh, Tim's point of coming back on, maybe listening to the second half of this at yep. your opportunity and continuing is really valid. But I've gone full circle now. And I should have reminded myself, and you reminded me of the lesson coaching double A hockey, where I was over coaching, over teaching, <clears throat> over technical. Mm -hmm. And I just finished proofreading a book on Fa Father Bauer, and his credo was technique matters, but let the spirit prevail. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I gotta go. Get Got to let him go, Wally. He's he's already ten minutes Thanks, over. Richard. Yeah. Okay. Gotta go. Talk to you later, okay. fellas. Take Thanks care. a lot. Bye bye. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, for the rest of you, my uh, my lesson is, and I'm going back to when I started to coach hockey. Um, let him play more. Don't worry about those details. To that degree, they're 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 not that important at the level he's talking about. 
And if they are, those kids are going to get their individual instruction, their individual high-priced help, which is largely all about offense, and that's fine too because the game's more fun with the puck. Nobody enjoys playing without it. So, Peter, welcome, Michael. Peter? Yeah, Tom, did you have something else? Your hand was up before me. Okay, I, I don't have anything else. I'm going to lower my hand. Hey, Tom, Tom, is your hand still Tom's up? Is up too, but I think you my hand's still up. I thought I took it down. Okay, I just want to. I just want to make. I just want. Uh, I need to know. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. I think. I mean, for me, I, I think what I what I pull out of what Richard was saying is how teaching the skills and being very very anal about how you do your crossover, how you hold a stick, all those things, as it applies to a a youth hockey practice. I agree with how it can bog down a practice for sure. However, somewhere in this, the kids still have to learn how to do things technically. Because if you can't do things technically, you're not going to be able to do them tactically, right? If you tell if if a if a a boy or a girl can't turn one way or the other, and the drill is the puck goes in the corner, pick it up on your forehand, come up the wall. Well, if that boy or girl can't turn the proper way because they haven't learned to work their edges, they're not going to be able to play the game. They're not going to have the fun because they're not successful because fun comes from some measure of success. So I think 100% you have to have the skills, and I think there can be a blend. I think at any practice we can work into certain skills depending upon what that, like, like I said, I call them sock drills. That's because I, I used to work for a, uh, a coach who when we tried to introduce small area games. He became incensed because he said, um, it sounds like it's too much fun. So we said, okay, let's call them small area competitions. Let's call them sock drills. And he was okay with that. And it was the exact same thing. But you can get better by introducing those different rules, techniques, but somewhere along the line, those kids are going to have to have the tactical and physical ability to perform that, right? So, I mean, that that's kind of that's kind of my thing. I, mean, I learn a lot, too. Actually, I'm learning a lot right now from a five-year-old grandson, and uh, I'm watching him, and I see now, because he's at the point where he's progressing, where he's learning to write, where he's uh, learning to read. Well, if he wasn't shown how to hold the pencil correctly, I'm not sure he'd be able to write. So he has to be able to learn. You have to teach the technical piece for sure. You just have to figure out how the blend of that all works, I think. No, oh, I, I, I agree with you, Peter. And uh, I just want to bring up a story where Tim and I, we were working uh, with many associations at the U8 level, and even younger, literally a learn to skate, learn to play program. And Tim and I both developed the routine of stick proper stick length and stick grip in the room, dressing room with the parents. They're learning to put on their equipment. The parents are learning about stick length and stick grip and teaching them to become the skill doctor for stick length and still grip at that age. Because mentioning the top hand under grip that isn't, that happens not often, but it does happen to elite players and they have to break that habit. So I'm just saying the teaching of that and their learning, there's, there's sort of an age period where but the line between boredom and detail is sort of the game we play. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards the age groups Tom working with and older uh, is not paying, not worrying as much about those detailed habits because their performance of the team is going to be better than worrying about those habits.
but there is a time and place to make a little more specific point like I did with the Calgary Flames coach and he happened to take it because losing D-side at that level and they're losing D-side an awful lot these days, Tim. <laughs> and, uh, you know, really, as, as anal as it may seem, I think all they have to do is right foot, left foot, two foot snow plows a little bit of the time. You know, why are they doing it? So they can control their skating. That's at the highest level. But you teach snow plows at the lower level. You teach inside edge mastery. But you don't do it like it's exciting to me because that's my boy, you know. But those kids and those coaches, God bless them. They couldn't give a tinker's damn about that. But it's important. So the art of coaching, you go back to the right stuff, right amount, right time, with whatever age group you've got, with whatever knowledge level you've got of the team you've got is what matters the most and I think that's what we have to figure out the most anybody else got anything uh, I'm I'm really I don't know if we've uh, Rick I'm really curious about your work you're doing in Strathmore and this conversation uh, I call it letting things go and letting them learn from it and I'm more worried about behavioral coaching, bad habits, bad behaviors, not listening, and and in game situations that show a lack of respect and trust than I am about X's and O's anymore. So, uh, Rick, please, can you comment on anything? It's, uh, I, I don't know where to start, to be honest with you, Wally. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I, I'm of the opinion that the, the coaching thing is part art, part science. Uh, I'm one of the guys like you that could be anal about details, about uh, repeating bad habits in practice without any attempt to correct them, running a drill or an exercise for the purpose of, we covered that and we've spent enough time on it, let's move on. If you don't do the correction thing, they're going to continue to do it in a fashion that's not to their to their best interest. So I think it's obligatory that we stop at some point. For me, if I'm in control of the whole situation, that's where you start your year. I, I start with an assessment of the group as a whole as to where they measure on the scale, what they're good at individually and collectively, what they need work on. And then we go from there and how we structure our drills or, or our practices. Um, we use the station format to deal with, let's say, crossovers. We would do uh, three different stations at three levels of competency, and we would pace it accordingly um, so that no one's caught in a situation where they're being held up by the slower ones or the less skilled, or they're all conversely being uh, rushed to keep up with the best of the group. Um, for me, that's that's worked very well over the years. That's what I try to try to um, uh, suggest to the coaches that I'm mentoring. Um, as far as the fun factor goes, uh, I ran a session last night for a U18 team. Uh, everybody was giggling and bubbling at the end of the session. The the three coaches that were involved said that's the best practice these kids have had all year. They were basically putting themselves in it, under the gun, and I said. It was all hockey. It was full ice drills. No disrespect, Wally, to the to the stations things, but we were working on on some specific aspects of the game. The kids skated hard. They found out that they can go far beyond what they thought their physical limitations were, as far as how much energy they could expend in an hour's ice time. And the fun aspect just came into it because they were they were playing hockey, but they were learning at the same time. I spent a great deal of time working one-on-one -on -one with players at the end of each rep. I'd pick one guy and go and talk to him about what he did or didn't do well or what he might want to do better. I got good response from all the players. But to me, it's it's the combination of the art and the science. You need to, to work on the fundamentals, the details, but you need to make it enjoyable so that they are involved. They want to do it. 
They're not doing it because you're telling them they have to do it. They're doing it because they enjoy doing it. And they learn according to that. Well, Rick, I I understand where you're coming from because I'm I'm the same kind of guy. But I've come to realize that the not everybody can do it. You can. And Richard's not talking about us. He's talking about coaches, average coaches. Oh, I realize that. Who aren't educated in the the details, the whole part, whole details of skills. So if they're not, if they don't have that, I, I'm not going to worry about it anymore. To that degree, the degree that I am. And I know that the end result, the fun, the activity, the learning and the improvement will occur by trial and error and they'll have more fun. So, uh, I'm, you know, Richard, I think, is listening to the, to the talk now while he's babysitting, but um, I guess the balance between teaching interruption, uh, that's what we're talking about here. Mike, go ahead, your hand's up, and Tom, your hand's still up if you want to interject after Mike. Okay, go ahead, Mike. And I, I'm, I'm actually now I'm very intrigued about listening to your uh, clips later on. But um, I apologize for being a little late. Uh, so just the gist of the conversation, I mean, I, it's funny. I've I just been following uh, on Twitter. I've been going back and forth with this um, uh, Stuart Armstrong, who's like kind of the he's a soccer guy in the UK. He's kind of gotten this little niche right now to be, you know, uh, the war on drills, like like eliminating drills like we shouldn't be having drills like there's no drills that that are any good for any kid and my debate has always really been and i'm a small area game guy i'm a i'm a fun you know let's fun first let's have like competition-based practices places here where we can uh put the kids in, in in you know their own environments to learn but i think one of the limitations we have especially in hockey is we don't have the time like we don't our our eight-year-olds don't skate every, like they don't have free play every day like we have such a limited window where we we tend to want to teach them how to do it the right way quicker because we don't have the luxury of waiting for them to get it on their own and i think to Wally, your point an experienced coach somebody that knows the the gray area of that like when to stop and fix and when to let them find it is there are very few people like that unfortunately. And I think in, in, in the, in the world we're living in right now in sport, uh, we don't have the time. Like I, I run a lacrosse program here in town and I, nobody is talking about free play development and time for touching and throwing and catching the ball. They're all worrying about when the schedule's coming out. Like when do we get, when's the game schedule coming out? I go, they can't catch a ball. Like I haven't seen, I haven't seen a team of eight year olds catch the ball yet. So why don't we, why don't we try to create an environment that way? Uh, but again, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing Richard's side of this and, and the uh, conversation earlier, but I, I would, I would imagine just based off of the, the, the little I've just heard, um, you know, a lot of it falls back to just not having the time and, and, and the ability for these kids to find the skill that they're looking for without us intervening quickly. As baby, as baby eats, <clears throat> and it's really ugly watching a baby eat. It can turn mm -hmm. you off food. <clears throat> <clears throat> the, the conversations among the experts like this group and other friends of mine who have been coaching for years are always riveting i can't wait i wish i could see where i wish you guys were where i am so i could actually watch tom or rick or any of you guys running your practices and so doing what doing. You're doing. because you guys have been doing it like i've been doing this 50 years you guys have been doing it a similar length of time the average lifespan of a minor hockey coach is about four years they take the kids at age six Coach them till they're about 10. Then they take off or the kid doesn't want them anymore to coach or whatever might, you know, whatever happens. What, what I was presenting is what do we do with the coaches 
who don't have the experience. Like there was a junior coach out this way who's coach junior. He coached junior for five years, junior girls. He said to me and to a colleague, he said to me face to face. And remember, I've coached 50 years. I have a very long resume as all you guys have. He said, what am I going to learn from you? I don't need a mentor. I've coached junior for five years. I don't. Jazzy, I'll be with you in a second. Um, um, I, 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 you have nothing to learn. I have nothing to learn from you. What can you provide me? So I said, okay, conversation's over. Wrong, wrong audience. There's no point spending any time with that guy. I do want to spend time with in, you know, the 90% of the coaches who haven't a clue how to embed individual instruction in a game or a drill, whatever you want to call it. Should we not have drills? Well, let's call it. Some, yes, Jazzy, I'm, I'm coming. Let, <laughs> what, what do we want to call it? I don't care what you call it. My friend Rick calls it a learning opportunity. I don't know if any of you guys know Rick Louder, sir. He's in uh, Lethbridge. Right? But um, he calls it a learning opportunity. I don't care what you call it. But why are we trying flow drills with 10 year olds? You know, full rank. Like, they don't know what they don't know. It's up to us to provide that instruction. That's why it, at the ripe old age that I am right now of 94 and still going at it, I feel it's my role now to provide coaches information and go, fellas, women, let's look at what we're doing and how we're doing it. Because there are other ways to do it, and we should be paying attention to those things. I got to get back to her dessert. I'm staying online, but I'm just off my mic here. Change those diapers. <laughs> You'll know when my nose starts twitching. You'll know, or I'll know when it's time. Mike, you got to. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't. I don't miss. I don't miss those days. I guess. I, I guess. I'll. I'll. Hopefully, I'll get them again later down the line. Um, so. Yeah, so I, I think I, to Richard's point, I mean, that's where really where I've kind of found my niche, right, is finding coaches that want to learn and then doing everything I can to help them learn. Like and, and giving them, you know, giving them the 25 years, 30 years of experience in a weekend. You know, you can do that. You can give them and say, hey, I'm going to give you the cheat code. I'm going to show you if you can do this with your kids, then you can concentrate on these other things. Like let's let's get away from the stuff that maybe looks like hockey. And, and you guys have had that Daryl on the on the call so many times that he'll talk about that a lot, right? It looks like hockey and it looks like it's the right thing to teach. And it, and the, and the parents see that there's a lot of flow and, and action and going up the ice. Um, I was giving an example the other day. I'm, I'm watching one of the high school practices. I won't say who, um, and all they do is work on regroup drills. All they do is work on regroup drills. Guy comes up the boards, they stop, they go back to the D, D to D, back to the D, up the boards, and up the right winger. And I've never, ever seen that in two years of watching them play. I've never seen them take the puck from the blue line and go back to the D, ever. It's always chip it in and get rid of it and, or try to beat a guy. So we're, you know, when I see that happen with a, a group of eight-year-olds, that, that they're not, you know, they don't know why they're doing it. Like they don't even realize how the context of that looks like in a game. So my, I always fall to, and then let's, let's put it, Let's put situations in that happen in the game every single day, and I'll help you find these games and drills. And again, I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm not a big drill guy either. Like I don't like block drills. I don't like kids standing and just doing a figure eight around the uh, around their their gloves. But they do have to have the competency and the muscle memory to move their arms and their body and shift their weight. And find a way to to find that so you can move on to the next level. Like I said, it comes back to if you're like I I went to a uh, I went to a, a a nice program with Mariano Rivera and he was talking about his you know his life and how you know he showed us how he built his first baseball mitt out of a out of a uh, a shopping bag you know and, and cut it up and folded it up and all of a sudden he's got a glove and you and you look and say he found how to do the things he did by doing them because he had all day to do it. And we we've extracted that from our kids. You know, we've taken that that opportunity away that if you're not like free play is not even they're not even a lot of the time for the free play. 
Because unless you're on the ice, unless you're with an instructor, and unless you're with a coach, I think a, a lot of our parents don't think they're learning anything. Um, but again, I think it's a lot of like letting them make mistakes. I use the analogy as often as I can in coaching clinics that, you know, we've never seen a kid get coached in the playground, right? We've never seen a kid get coached on the monkey bars and on the slide. They just watch and they go, oh, I like what that kid's doing. Or, oh, that kid is swinging from there to there to there to there. And I tried to do it and I fell, but I'm going to watch the older kids and I'm going to learn. Like you never see, you know, a parent, there's no private instructors for the playground. And, you know, that's how kids learn. And I think we've lost, we've lost a lot of it. I know in my world and in, in the hockey world I'm in, I've seen that more and more and more. I've seen a lot of kids that can have a lot of skill that don't understand how to translate that skill anywhere. Well, to, isn't, to, to some extent, Mike, isn't that what, um, kind of skill development drills are you you set up uh, and that's where again I, I i think it's it's a blend of all these things you got to find you got to play games you got to slow it down and do some actual skill instruction and development but that's what that is it's like playground it's like it, you can see the people in front of you going and it's like oh you know that's how i learned a lot i remember i mean just some people are visual learners i was one and learning how to play tennis. I learned a ton just from watching people play on TV and like, how do you hit a backhand? And what is your body look like? And what's the follow through look like? And what's the setup look like? You, you know, I, I think it's unquestionable that if you want to get to a high level of competency, you have to have some specific skill instruction. Now the trick comes in, as we all know, the trick is in the balance, you know, and, you know, Sam Holmes here in, with Girls Hockey Calgary, she learned pretty early with the little young girls, uh, six, seven, eight years old. She would do five minutes, literally five minutes of, of some kind of a skating skill. And then they play a game for 10 minutes. Yeah. And then they do five minutes of stopping and then they play a game and maybe create a rule even at that level you create a rule mm -hmm. where you have to stop and change direction or whatever but it, it's the balance between the specific and the random and the fun and everything else that that's the trick of it and and it's i don't think there's a, a single formula but the basic message is make sure you have lots of fun do a little bit of skill instruction and uh and then, you know, some randomness will take place. Yeah, and I think we're in, if you create the right environment, right, you can allow them to have fun. And then be, that's what I love about station-based training is I can put kids in groups to have fun and play, but I can extract the one kid without affecting the other 20. Like I can say, hey, listen, you know, I, I, like I can't tell you how many clinics I've been to. I do, I do a lot of NHL learn to play clinics. So I go around to different rinks and different places and try to help them and, and just to help them format how they look on the ice. And I can't tell you how many times I've been on the ice in like week four or five or six where I see a kid has the wrong stick. Like he's just holding the stick in the wrong hand, completely in the wrong hand. I'm like, it, it, it's six weeks in. We haven't seen that. Like we haven't been able to fix that. And, and it, some of you might say, oh, well, he's got to learn on his own. He'll eventually get it. Well, maybe he won't. And, and he'll never learn how to hold the stick. So or, or when he does, he's wasted all of that that valuable time of, you know, you know, of, of skill development, but I agree it's, it's never. And that's, I think my argument with this guy was there's no absolutes. There's no, like, <clears throat> if you do block training drills in the corner, yes, you're going to get really good at making a first stick handling move and maybe burst out of the zone, but then what? Okay. So now you have to have, there needs to be layers of how we teach. And more importantly, they have to be fun layers at every level. You guys know you've coached at the highest levels of the game. You can't have a miserable 45 minute practice. You have to create fun. And to, to Rick's point, like I can't tell you how many times I've run an 18 U practice with the exact same lesson plan as I do with my learn to play kids. The exact, literally the exact same lesson plan. It just looks a lot different because of the speed and the, and the competency and the compete level and all, but the laughing's there, the fun's there, the ribbing's there, the, Hey, I just beat you and you beat me. Like I, I, I do that all the time. My, I, we in our power skating station in our in our in our eight and under group is is border tag. 
three boarders and they play tag. And, and, then we, and then to your point, Tim, we add, okay, here's the constraint. You can only use your inside edges when you go around, you know, now they're doing Mohawks and now they're doing pivoting. And now, oh, you can only, you know, you have to try to be, you can't go around without being on one foot. Oh, now we're going to add, if you want to tag somebody, you could jump over the border. But, but if you fall down, even if you tag the person, you, you, you don't tag them. Like you have to be able to stand on your feet. So they learn how to stop. They learn how to pivot. They learn how to, and they don't even know they're doing it. They're just doing it because it's like part of the game. Like, oh my God, I'm not allowed to fall down. But I, I can't tell you how many coaches I've worked with, hundreds now, right, that can't even get to that point because they don't understand the process. Yeah. Michael, I want to bring this point up, watching uh, Wes and Tom, exactly the same point. Um, I've been trying to get them to experiment with stuff that I think would help and I did a two-on-zero, two-on-one progression that was created by Yuri Krolik at a goaltending slash scoring clinic with the national women. Same drills I did with the national women. And both coaches adapted and did the drill. Tom let me run the drill. And I, the reason I thought the drill was important is they can't make a pass across on attack. They're U13 girls, top level girls in the city. And I'm wondering, is this too soon for them? But after doing the drill, and it was, you know, really done because to satisfy me, because I badger them so much about it. And I bought this expensive, uh, microphone, remote mic, and I ran the, the drill from the bench to the discomfort of both coaches, and I, I sense that, but yet I saw the games, and I don't know whether I saw pass crosses. And last night, Wes repeated the same drill in his plan, and they finally did the drill and it looked like it had accomplished, was accomplishing a purpose. So for me, in, in the role I'm trying to play, that's sort of the influence with high-level coaches. Now, Tom's a very high-level coach. Wes is aspiring to be. And the art of being able to influence coaches, which, Rick, you do on a full-time basis, there's it's a mystery and you know the one guy i want to ask a question of sitting back leaning back in his office chair he's been there done that probably more than all of us hell you take off and let's hear your thoughts and whether you got anything to add on this okay good morning everybody um i was on another call and i was glad to get off it and get on this um, I mean, I think it's right. I, I, we have I mean, everything I've been hearing is to me, it makes so, so much sense. And, you know, the fact that we get, you know, am, we have amateur coaches, uh, coaching amateur kids and the coaches don't stick around very long. Um, you know, I, the way I go about it is again, as it was mentioned, like with this team I had this year, you know, within two or three practices and watching them play a game, I go, ooh, we got problems. But our problems were fundamental skill problems, not not their wanting to play hard or not. And that, they just couldn't make two passes in a row. And they played too slow. And um, and then they and, and coming out of the zone, you know, they're trying to hit the far wing all the time. And they only have to get it by two or three opponents to get there. So by just making some adjustments, our, our game got so much better. But I utilized the, the practice format of uh, soft skills, hard skills, game skills as sort of a broad uh, format. And the soft skills was, you know, uh, and I picked pick that up from somebody in this group. Um, you know, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to scrimmage cross ice or Whatever. Sometimes we only had one goalie. Sometimes two. Um, you know, whatever. Whatever we had, 
we just played. We and we played hard for 20 minutes. Now we know, and I've now done some research on this. The average kid in a youth program um, uh, only skates for 11 minutes of meaningful time in a in a 60 minute practice. And this format that I put together gets us up to 20, uh, 28 to 32 minutes. And of course, you got to rest a little bit because these are bantams. And so we get them going pretty fast. And we did in the in the hard skills, it was, you know, it's power skating. And their, you know, their most favorite drill was backwards uh, chops, we call them Russian chops. And they're just skating backwards, crossing over, crossing over and trying to swing, you know, the one leg up to their shoulder height and then bringing it across and putting it down. Now they were they were horrible at it at the beginning of the season. I mean, they could hardly do the drill, and within a month they were, they were you know they were all pretty much accomplished at it, except for there's always some kids that don't want to get better, so they always cheat on on their skating drills, and that's that's life. Okay, so yeah, I I don't know, it is it's an art, it's a science, and it's a people management job. Um, coaches have to manage the players, have to manage the other coaches, and you got to manage the parents. And it's, I think it's a really hard job, but it's pretty rewarding. I don't know if I was on the call last week, but um, this team I had ended up just playing so well the last two weeks in our district playoffs, and we got five games. It's a double, a double elimination format. And they were just, I told the kids Edwards, I, I was really emotional about this in the locker room. It says, you did everything I asked you to do this year. Everything we started to do at the beginning and we worked toward, it was like, it was like a, the symphony out there. You did it. And, I, and I, as a coach, I'm going, this is amazing how much progress that this team made in spite of all the problems that we had. Most of them were off ice issues. Um, and um, I just felt, you know, extremely lucky to have had the opportunity to work with these kids and to see the kind of progress that they did make. We weren't expected to get past one game in the district playoffs, and we got we got to five. So in in three of them, we lost two, we won three, and all, uh, uh, yeah, in in four of the five games were overtime games, and we had two to one overtime. With the eventual two teams that are going now now going on to the um, to the state tournament, so um, you know it's it's teaching. It's hard to transfer everything that we know to somebody else, right? I mean, because how, how does how does somebody with with fifty years worth of coaching? I'm actually now in my fifth decade of it. How do you transfer this information down to somebody who's in his fourth year of coaching or fifth year of coaching and has a kid on the team and thinks that his only job is to make sure his kid gets a lot of ice time. And so, um, I don't know. Uh, Richard, go ahead. Richard, your hand's up, I think, but your speaker, there yeah. you go. But, yeah, go ahead. Okay. It's done. Got a dog whining and a baby walking. Anyway, all right. Um, let me throw on my video here as well. Hello. Oh, that's not working. Okay, never mind. So I, I've become more convinced in recent years, I guess it's the teacher in me, um, very positive towards coaches and to get, to get everybody better and blah, 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 blah. I'm, I've always been convinced that coaches want to be better and they just don't know how. And there's nobody to really show them. I'm back to the you know lack of the, the leadership vacuum um, regionally, certainly in Ontario and, and nationally. I'll give you a few really practical examples of what I've seen uh, in organizations that I've worked with. In, in Oshawa, when I arrived, I, some months after I arrived here from Ottawa, um, I noticed that pretty much every team was doing a regroup drill, just like Mike was describing. You know, pass it to the two defensemen at the far blue line, get the puck back, attack two other defensemen, break out, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, the team, the nine-year-olds were doing it. The 14-year-olds were doing it. The 16-year-olds were doing it. Tier one was doing it, AAA. Tier four was doing it. House, everybody was doing it. And when I'd ask the coaches, why are you doing that? Well, we have to be able to regroup. Oh, okay. Then they would do breakout drills. Well, why, why are you doing breakout drills? Well, we have to get out of our own zone. Then the question becomes, well, how does a regroup of breakout start? Well, you take the puck behind the net, and that's no. No. It starts from regaining possession of the puck. So how are you going to incorporate that? With the Whippy Girls Association in the last couple of years, uh, I asked the coaches, can your girls turn to the right? And they went, wow, well, no, they have a lot of trouble with it. Well, what are you doing to correct that? Uh, I don't know. What do you suggest? How about when they get on the ice, you have them go clockwise instead of counterclockwise? They started doing that. Now the girls can turn better to the right. Uh, coaches, well, are you giving the, the kids any time to play with the pucks by themselves? Uh, should we do that? Don't you want to play with the puck? <laughs> Don't you want them to become more comfortable with the puck? So every coach, I didn't mandate it. I just said, you know, put it in the form of a question. If you want the kids to be better with a the puck, they got to play with a puck. So now the coaches were all started starting their practices for up to 10 minutes playing with pucks. But then they had to take it to the next level. Is it just playing with pucks or are they going to actually flip the puck into a bucket, flip the puck to the glass? Can you flip the puck over the net? Can you flip the puck to a partner who knocks it down? Like as Mike was suggesting, all kinds of ways to play something very simply and then adding rules to it to improve their 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 technique right by trying it you don't try you don't get so i've always been convinced and i'm convinced even more so now that coaches want to learn they want to get better we need to provide them those open opportunities as and as everybody was talking here before and i'm sniffing my nose to see if she's dumped yet, but um, I got an email from the president of the association out here in Oshawa saying, we want to go ahead with your presentation before tryouts in April. We just got to find the right day because they recognize that let's provide coaches some extra tools. That's our roles are so important, whether we're 60 years old or 92 years old, our roles as experienced educators and coaches is vital. We are the heartbeats of the program. I cannot stress enough how important we are um, and that it's time for, you know, the governing bodies to recognize it. And I will now deal with the baby. Excuse me. Huh. Uh, I just wanted to make reference to these adaptations at practice, the nuances, the details that I've witnessed addendum with Tom's team and with Wes's team this year, 2U13 team. Tom is, the, the girls are learning to pass the puck, make decisions. And when you're talking regroups, in last night's scrimmage, Tom, they were regrouping. I saw one double D to D. I saw a D to D and up. I didn't see an evasive tight turn. It wasn't required. But I saw the work they've done on passing happen in a scrimmage where two teams were mixed, whites against black, whole ice scrimmaging. That's the measurement of what you're doing working. So the amount to which the coach understands that is sort of the art of what I think Richard is mastering, trying to get things across, not for us, but for the coaches out there who, like he said, they want to get better. They really do. And the thing I struggle with is being more comfortable and helping them get better. And Richard, I, 
I think you you've done more of it than than I have, working with a an association that you, you literally grew up in, coached through, and the comfort zone of them appreciating what you're doing and coming to you and maybe asking you at times for ideas, that's when you know your time is worthwhile. So, Richard, can you uh, talk about sort of the successes of what you've done and those kind of moments where you think they're really getting it? You mentioned the... Uh, that won't take long. <laughs> The practice you you ran, so uh, Rick in Strathmore, you mentioned the practice, the U18, and how well it went over. Well, you got permission to run a practice, and it was appreciated. So you're you've got you you now have acceptance within the organization that group of people anyway. So you seem to be making mentorship headway, which is what we're trying to do is make headway so that this is going to help more coaches, therefore more players and parents down the road. Rich, can you speak to that? Uh, Rick or Rick? Rick? Rick, I'm sorry, Rick Putter. yeah. I wasn't sure, Wally. Yeah, I'm um, Certainly within this one group, I have uh, I have a greater level of acceptance of my involvement than uh, than with some of the other groups. But this is my third year doing this with this uh, this particular organization. And each year has been a, an incremental step, although a a, a very uh, short step. Let's put it that way. Um, one of the, one of the things that I see that isn't working here is and it goes back to what Richard's talking about is coaches don't know. Um, and if he's going to get in for a preseason uh, introduction to the group that he mentioned on his last uh, last talk here, uh, I think that's where it has to start. Um, when I've gotten involved, they're already a month or a month and a half into their season. They've already done enough things that are are going to have to be undone in a lot of cases, and then you get that reluctance to make that change. Um, so it, it, the idea of having mentorship in particular for new coaches and outline all of the things that they should look forward to and be aware of and be prepared for is, in my opinion, quite critical. Trying to come in afterwards and trying to uh, uh, right the ship, so to speak, is, is a very difficult proposition. Richard, in that regard, and I'm speaking of mentorship of AAA and AA competitive teams, I I don't even look at X's and O's. I don't even right. look at practices. I look at the game and behavior, discipline, effort, respect, learning, getting better, improvement. And I believe that teams that are not successful beat themselves because of their behaviors, their bad habits. And I'm not talking technical bad habits, I'm talking behavioral habits. Reaction penalties, staying out too long, being an official, and the coach is not picking up on it and addressing it. And I think that's more obvious than the nuances of X's and O's that we are experts in. So I'm I'm dedicating my time now to, and Tim has brought up the idea of every association having an ethical director. And I think that's, I think we have a better opportunity for success because the problems at competitive levels and they will curve too soon. Um, the score clock is the only thing they think about. In fact, the only thing the coaches sort of think about versus the things they're doing to lead to a better result. But behaviorally, that's... 
that's what I've uh, I've come to grips with not worrying as much about that and enjoying the quality of coaching that I see going on in terms of how the players behave and how they're treated and, and boy they're having fun but the, I've, I've had I've had the impression that <clears throat> in working with various organizations here and also in Ottawa that um, uh, if I if I provide coaches the right tools and point them in the right direction to the kinds of things they should be or shouldn't be doing per the example of doing uh, you know breakouts and regroups with nine-year-olds then they are more likely to come to you to you after the fact and say listen i want to teach my kids how to do a two-on-one what do you suggest i want to teach my kids how to four check what do you suggest you know we've always we've had it backwards for for eons um i don't want to tell you how to four check i don't want to tell you how to do a two-on-one or or a breakout why don't you look at the way of, of what you know about how the game should be taught. What are the roles of the game? What are the principles of the game? How are you packaging this? Then we can address, if you want, the kinds of tactics that or skills that you think the kids should have. And I found that, that uh, coaches are open to that. They want that. I've had a lot of coaches say, boy, you really opened my eyes to different approaches. And I'm taking a much different approach now, and the kids are responding better. Um, the problem has been the organizations, like the local organizations, don't have people on their boards who are willing to stand up and say, that uh, Kozak guy or that Bothwell guy, let's, let's bring him in because we really believe in the messaging and the approach our coaches need to take. But because the people on the boards themselves have virtually no background technically, the strong technical people are not on the boards. They're on the ice, like us. Um, they don't know what they don't know either. And if they're looking to the governing bodies to provide them that guidance, they're not getting it. Because for years, I heard coaches in in Montreal and Ottawa say, "Well, what does Hockey Canada say about doing this? You know, what does Hockey Quebec say about doing this? What do the governing bodies? What are the people in those 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 aren't the people who." We're providing the information. That's that's a real issue. And uh, uh, Richard, I, I'm going to ask Michael: Is Hockey USA doing a better job than Hockey Canada at providing some guidance and direction? So I think I, I think so. I mean, I think what they've done with their with their modeling is um, they've. The information's out there. The education's out there. The the form. I mean, you literally, if you had a like, if you're a new coach and you had a question about where to start and what the process is and kind of what the pathway would be, it's a no brainer. I mean, it gives you a step by step by step guide on what you can do. Now, to Richard's point, it now is going to take the leap of, are do you have people willing to do that and fight the the naysayers that say you know, well, that's not us, or we need to do this, or I did it this way. Like they got, like those, that's like the worst comment in the world, right? So the, the, that's, uh, you know, I did it this way. <laughs> like, yeah, well, I realize that. And uh, I've seen you skate. Um, you know, so I, I don't think that might be, you might not be the best example, but I think, and, you know, 90% of your kids quit every year. Uh, so I think it's just, I think they do have a great job. I think they're, they're what we failed at at the USA hockey level is the messaging that, the programming that they're um, showing the organizations that the coaches to use is not a fun model, although there's a lot of fun in there. It's a high performance model that if you were going to, if you wanted to produce the best player that you could produce, you would follow this model. And I think what gets lost is like with cross ice and blue pucks and small area games is that's more of a fun model. That's not a high performance model, which in fact is wrong. Just, I don't think people, they haven't done a great job of messaging that, in my opinion. But that's where that's where I get most of my business from. So that's okay. <laughs> most of the programs I work with, I've worked, I've worked, I'm working with about seven different organizations right now, and they're all, they literally are cookie cutter organizations. They're all the same. They have a board that is way above, you know, way over their skis on decision making because they don't know. They're not, they're not in the, you know, they're not in the, 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 um, 
you know, they're not in the battle. They don't, they, they've never been in the battle. They don't understand, um, the, the long-term athletic development process and they're, and the, and to every, everyone, we've had these conversations a million times here. They never stay in it long enough to make the influence. Even the ones that are do understand it. They're only there for two, three years and they just never get to complete the cycle. And most people that I work with, you know, they're bitter, they get burnt out and they quit. So the great people you get, they try it, they fight, they fight, they fight. By the time they make a little bit of headway, their kid graduates out and ages out, they move out and they move on. And then the next person comes in that, you know, uh, feels they can do it a different way as well. Um, I, I do think govern. if I'm a part of a governing body, I would hope that the governing body would have more um, teeth. I guess, you know, if they're, like USA Hockey gives a lot of money out to the organizations. I mean, they bring in a lot of money, but they spend a lot of money. And my point has always been, well, then spend it on the programs that want to follow the guide that you're given, not the Maverick programs that are, that don't follow any of what you're doing because they, they shouldn't benefit then from the financial windfall that, that like we have, that you couldn't have here. Like here we have what's called model programs. So a program that follows a specific age appropriate guideline for each age group, USA Hockey goes out and makes them a model program. That's, you know, no leaving on Wednesdays for tournaments, you know, more practices and games, uh, age, age appropriate and age level developer, like a coordinator. So you have an eight U coordinator, 10 U coordinator like this. And even when I hire and restructure programs, I tend not to hire a hockey director as much as I hire individual level coordinators. They're just more impactful. They're right in it. Everything they do is for that level. And then, and they don't have to, you know, they don't have to get clouded by the bigger picture of, you know, every single level having the same problem. But I guess to answer your question, um, I, I do think we do a, a better job than, than Hockey Canada. Okay. Listen, I don't know if Dominic Pittis in Stockton, California, <clears throat> with his U18 girls and boys program is with us. Dom, uh, if you are, Turn your speaker off. I'd like to know what you're thinking of what you might have heard, if you've heard it. Hey, Wally, sorry. Um, yeah, I've been just kind of listening in, just trying to get some some work done here. We have our girls program, which is going to be going to the high school nationals uh, in in a couple of weeks here. So just trying to, trying to prepare for that. But um, yeah, to be honest, Wally, I just, you know, it's, uh, just kind of paying attention and listening to as to what everybody's opinion is. And, um, you know, I think, well, you know, my thoughts on that, I've, I'm in agreement with a lot of what's being said and just, you know, the, the group's philosophy in regards to, uh, skill development and, and that, and as far as the, you know, the kind of the moral compass that you kind of want to have as a, as a coach, but, um, no, not not much to add to to it, Wally. Other than just uh, just kind of being a fly on the wall here. Anybody else that's a fly on the wall that's got something to offer to the uh, discussions? Well, uh, I I uh, find something that's really effective to do is have tournaments within your practice. So you put multiple nets maybe on the side, even the little nets, or if you've got a lot of goalies, it all depends. And you have tournaments, uh, either round robin or like, uh, oh, what's that one called? Where if you win, you go to the right. If you lose, you go to the left. And everybody plays everybody. And you change the rules, have different modified rules every game. Maybe the goals have to come on one-touch shots, or maybe they have to come on given goals, or... This kind of thing I think is really, really valuable to do. And it's really hard for the players because they're playing all the time. It's ex extremely exhausting uh, when you have tournaments like that. I've never heard that mentioned here. So I just thought I'd brought it, bring it up. Tom, you did, uh, you managed large numbers in junior high school gymnasiums with that kind of idea. Can, can you talk a bit about years ago, your junior high experience and given the challenge of having too many numbers and too little space and how it worked out so well for you? 
Well, I get two classes, so you get between 40 and 60 kids in a three badminton court gym, which is a little bigger than a full court volleyball, you know. And what I would do is I get extra lines put on the floor or whatever. So say we're playing volleyball, I put uh, the post at each end and just have a, a, a rope, not the net, so that they could do that because we always did a, a run at the start. And then with the three badminton courts, we I made them. Now there are six courts because I had a line between the uh, the courts. So then I put them in twelve teams. So say there's sixty kids or in, in twelve teams of five. And then whatever our focus was that day, you know, maybe it's a forearm pass. And then do some drills on that technique and this kind of stuff. You can walk around and you help them, and then have a, a tournament and where they have to use a forehand pass. And then I would have a round robin tournament on the wall in a uh, laminated. So the winning team, one player from each team would go up to that uh, thing and, and circle the winning team. Then they find where their team goes next and the kids would just move. And you know, we'd either keep going with that or have another lesson to go. And, you know, same thing. Most gyms have six basketball courts. And, uh, you know, you're round robin or King's Court where the winning team stays where they are. The losing team goes to the left. The winning team goes to the right. And a new, you know, they work themselves up if they're winning. The, the best teams end up playing. It's a great way to pick teams, too. Like in hockey, you have that. And all your best players end up at one end because when they win, they go that direction. But I I did that uh, all of the time because, you know, junior high kids, you don't want them sitting around doing nothing because they're going to go do something. And uh, it, it really worked for me. And this stuff, these ideas were from Yuso, my Finnish friend, using, it's all about using space. Even, even running a practice, managing the pucks. So as soon as the drill is over, you tell them where the pucks go next. They don't have your assistant coach out there running, moving pucks. Then they come, they don't even know what they're doing because, you know, they didn't hear the instruction for the next drill. And, uh, you know, using space and not wasting time going from point A to point B. And I know all of us here give, give give drills names once they learn them. So you just say the name of the thing and only use a board. Maybe the first time it's good to use a board to show where people go and stand, you know, to start, to drill or a game. And, uh, you know, like Wes last night, we, we shared the ice the last part of the practice. There's two teams on the ice at once. And he wanted to do either the uh, three-second game or one pass in each zone game. We combined teams. And then we refined it because we've done that to two seconds. And it works better. The puck moved good, really well. And uh, the kids change on their own. So, you know, just having a template that everybody knows what's going on first is uh, really eliminates a lot of waste of time on the ice. And in the gym, it really worked well for me. You know, Tom, uh, at the end of practice, the both teams, two different teams, competing against each other for bragging rights. And right now, they're going into the playoffs. And I look at the scores, and uh, I say, anybody could win. You know, it's... It's so unpredictable. Scoring is not really a natural uh, occurring thing with kids that age. Well, <laughs> well, our team, we and Wes's team, we don't shoot team. We double the other team's shots, but the girls don't shoot. We only got a few girls that can shoot, you know. And our goalie's five foot tall, yeah. so a lot of times the score doesn't indicate what to happen in the play whatsoever, you know. So. But so my my point there's here. There's no doubt. Play us tomorrow. There's no doubt we will outplay the other team. Yeah. I don't know whether we'll outscore them. Yeah. 
Anyway, at the end of the practice, uh, the best part of the practice, Tom, when they gathered in the circle, both teams, it's a traditional thing in female hockey. Yeah. And I don't know if it started with the national team, but they did this team cheer. And I looked at the the one big girl, I think, on your team, Tom. She sort of took the lead. I could hear her voice. It gave me everybody to start the count and the stick banging laying down. And they all laid down with their sticks in the middle. Yeah. On the middle sort of <coughs> But that's sort of an indication of they enjoyed each other. They had a a lot of fun. And boy, they had a lot of conditioning. And when we're talking about all of Richard's points of his SEEP program, it was outstanding. Did it satisfy my needs, your needs? No, it's not about our needs. It's about the kids' needs. And they were doing unbelievable things for the entire practice so uh richard i don't know if you're still with us you got your hand up you might have left it on but i just would like to turn it back to you if you're there go ahead richard yeah i'm here sorry i left my hand up i'd like to announce that uh, my granddaughter has now gone down from her nap and i am uh free here to uh delve deep more deeply into whatever um what what tom was just talking about is exactly the kind of thing more coaches need to learn about what to do in practice you know many many tournaments and whatnot uh when I, in my program i had the slide up that said um game like and i and again, I, I, in the presentation, I, I don't want coaches to think that it has to be a, like tag is a game. You know, a, a mini tournament is a, are types of games, one against one, two against two, uh, however you want to arrange it. Uh, playing uh, cops and robbers on the ice is a type of game. It's amazing the resistance coaches have to just doing something really goofy. Like, have you ever done a, a game with your kids um, where they play with a, a small football, you know, one of those little plastic footballs. Uh, and I, well, yesterday I we started with a soccer ball. There you go. So same thing, only different. So um, Cassie did it. Right. Right. And and the kids love it, and it's a great equalizer. The kids with burning speed can't can no longer just fly by people. And you you approach the game differently, and it's just fun. It it addresses each of those uh, six elements. Like I remember a video that Dave King did uh, in the early 80s when he was doing all that stuff for Hockey Canada. I think I've mentioned it, I don't know how many times before. The warm-up to Team Canada's practice. 22 guys on the ice, they're playing 11 aside, and, and Dave is skating up and down the boards, whistling. You know how he whistles with his, with his fingers in his mouth type of thing? Um, whistling and calling, oh, we had a nice play. You know, it's a six-on-four break type of thing. It's that it was the warm up. And I've said to coaches, why can't you do that? What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it. It's awesome. Have some fun. Let go. You know, yeah. <clears throat> Richard, I, I want to. Uh, this is for Tom and Wes, who isn't with us. I've wanted to experiment with stuff that Dave did because he did it with a national team. And it would work at that level unbelievably well i feel and the one game that he played it was sort of his start the game warm-up i watch him do it with the calgary flames i saw him do it with the national team tom i would uh, i would ask you to do it with your teams both teams if you practice together the first activity after the goalies have had some shots is a three puck scrimmage, nine versus nine. We've done that. We've yep. done that a few practices this year. Yep. And I haven't seen it where you keep score out of, if you get two out of three, the first team to get two goals in out of the three pucks wins. And the fun of it is they don't know whether they should attack or defend because there's three pucks. 
And Dave said, if you use two pucks, it polarizes. You get a game going sort of at each end, and there isn't transition thinking in it. So much for the technical boring stuff. Three pucks and fun. And the Calgary Flames were doing it, having a good time. And I think it was the third practice I observed. They dragged that game out. It got 18 minutes. They deliberately tried not to score so they could scrimmage. <laughs> and they pulled the wool over Dave's eyes, and uh, I started to realize, geez, <laughs> okay, you might want to get on to something else or maybe just let them play with one puck and keep scoring. Uh, now having Tom said what he did, just have a bunch of mini games and a competition, and they might accomplish a hell of a lot more than his deliberate practice. So, even with a game like that, which is which is wonderful, you know, going back to the constraints led approach that I had on a slide in the presentation, you put little rules in there. Uh, anytime there's a play around the puck, no more than three players can be involved. As I'm just throwing out an example, of course, or two players can be involved or, you know, any number of you can you can't carry the puck over a blue line or you can only you can't carry the puck over center ice. And once you throw in little limitations like that, now players are starting to think and they're starting to look and they're starting to count players around them and looking, well, I can't have more than three players around the puck, but um, using I can use support. Now you go back to my six elements it's fun, it's game-like, it's challenging, it's competitive, there's a high fitness component. All those elements are in there. When I did this present, when I met with these Oshawa coaches last week, last Friday night, and I still remember it because I only had a beer and a half. Um, and um, one of the coaches, the, the head coach of the team, who's an outstanding coach, he's, he's one of the best I've seen. And Tony said to me, uh, are you expecting uh, all six of these elements in this presentation to to be in every practice or in every activity in every practice and of course i answered the question with the question what do you expect and he said well i think they should be in every activity you do in every practice i said okay that's your approach go for it so i'm handing it back to the adult and th this is a key principle of of what we need to do as leaders in the game is, all right, what do you think? Why don't you go try it? An experience is the best teacher, but how do you get the experience? You don't try, you don't get. Yeah, I want to jump in, uh, Rich, because, well, on two things, because now you just brought up another point, but um, I was, I, I have been designing uh, these, these, uh, we called it a, a, a January skill splits for one of the organizations I work with. And one of the pieces was that we were going to every drill and every game that we're putting in there was to uh, be built so that the coaches could take them and use them over and over and over again. It wasn't like a one and done. It was like, hey, these are a bunch of different samples of drills and games and play that you can use. And then you then we want you to incorporate this into your practices moving forward. And you know, to, to your to, to you know to your conversation about letting adults be adults and 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 be a coach, which is the most exciting part about being on the ice with the kids, is I had designed the drill. I looked over, I'm watching the coach. He completely changed it. It was the same concept though, because in his mind he had to you know, lack of a better term, dumb it down for the six year olds and the skill level he was working with. But this same concept was there. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I moved the drill around. I go, no, no, they're your kids. You know them better than anyone. You're you're in the drill. Like, don't keep doing something that's not working just because I'm giving it to you. You understood the concept. You were able to change it and fit it to the to the level you're at. So I think that's so important to allow coaches to just say, I can't just yeah. you know download a bunch of drills offline and try to fit them into my team. You have to use the the the, the kind of the blueprint and the path and then cater to the group that you have. That's, that's outstanding. And, and, and in fact, when I met with these guys last week, um, one of the people in the, that we met with was an assistant coach on the team who doesn't have a lot of coaching experience, but a very bright fellow, businessman. 
And he said, I really like your stuff. I really like the presentation. I really like the content. Um, what about if you just give coaches, you know, drills and games to play? And I said, I've never done that. Never going to do that. You don't learn how to coach by working from a recipe. Okay. Uh, teachers in a classroom have a curriculum, but how they teach it, how they package it, how they present it over the course of a semester or a year is an entirely different thing. You have to try these things. And if I just give you the recipe, you'll never learn how to do it. So with coaches, with the coaches I've worked with, I've often pointed them, frequently pointed them to the um, ADM site, admkids.com. I yep. said, you look at those, those lesson plans for whichever group, or go to the Hockey Canada uh, app if you, if you prefer, but the, the, the USA one is really clearly, it's, it's, it's a really nice design. Take any one of those, steal it blind, but don't steal it blind. Look at what things you think your kids should or shouldn't do, can or can't do, and how do you make a challenging, competitive, decision-making, fun, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What can you do to address these six elements with that practice plan? There may be things in that practice plan you feel are completely inappropriate for your kids right now. Because that is a practice plan. Like it's Hockey Canada's um, list of skills that they have on their site. They've had it there for years. And coaches often refer to it. I said, that's great. But how many levels of hockey are there in your organization? Some organizations have six, seven, eight levels of hockey because they, they, they uh, tier the house leagues. And then they have four levels of competitive above it. There is no such thing as a curriculum that can address all seven or eight levels. You're going to have to address that somehow. How are you going to do that? Richard, I totally agree observing that all year with one coach who's following that model. <clears throat> I want to get Tim. He's had his hand up for a while. Tim, please. Thanks. Thanks, Wally. Uh, I mean, there's there's so much stuff to sort of unpack and everything here. I, I'm not sure um, one of two directions I want to go in, but if if we go, I'll I'll take the diversion uh, divergent path, I guess. If we go, if we go all the way back when when we were talking before, sorry, that's my phone ringing. But um, if we go all the way back when Richard, you were talking early on about the game being whatever numbers you use, 45% one on one, and a lot of it's two on two and three on three, and and that that is very true. But like a lot of things, I think it's important that coaches recognize that. The one-on-one -on -one or the two-on-two -two or the three-on-three -three is still happening within a context of a five-on-five -five game. And so, you know, and sort of bringing in the, the four roles of hockey, like uh, and we talked about it before, like I really love uh, Bill Beanie's PSB thing where you've got a person with the puck or a person on the puck defensively. And then you've got two people that are S- supporting the puck offensively, defensively. And then you've got two other people who are the Bs providing balance. And so I think it's really important that we keep the focus on the fact that it's a complex five on five game because really the way it's trending at the minor level now is away from the five on five play and what we see or we tend to see, and this is just anecdotal and it's just um, sort of a subjective observation, is way more one on one play, but way less Russian hockey five on five play for a vivid way to put it together, where, you know, somebody gets the puck and it's like one on one. And now you got four people watching instead of the old Tarasov thing that those four people watching are really what drive the game. What they do and how they react is what makes hockey what it is. That one person with the puck should be and needs to be dependent on those other four players 
to play the best hockey possible. So, although I agree that developing one-on-one skills is very important, uh, developing two-on-two, three-on-three close puck support is important, but let's not lose sight of the fact that it's still a five-on-five game and that's the essence of hockey is how the four players away from the puck cooperate with the one person that has the puck. So I just thought I'd kind of interject that as a way to maybe make sure we, and we as collective coaches are, are thinking about the game the right way. I don't know if that. I agree sense. with you. 100%, except the, the only, the only catch, the only fly in the ointment here is that with kids, and I'm going to say defining kids is up to about age 12, 13, roughly, that there's way too much going on in a game to spend a ton of time with what goes on with players three, four, five on the ice, or maybe four or five on the ice. Um, it's really difficult to do. Coaches are not equipped to figure out how to do that. But, and not for a moment am I suggesting to spend your whole season on one against one. Or spend half your season on one against one and two against two. No, no. Somewhere along the line, they have to learn how to play the game, what your other roles are. Um, but we have to consider the age group. We have to bring it, bring ourselves back from our own experiences as coaches as, and players when we have a pretty good idea of what to do for the fourth or fifth player or the furthest player from the from the puck, you know, for offensively or defensively. The kids can't think in those terms. I'm going back to this coach, Tony, that, that I met with on Friday. And he did a, a – I saw his practice before. We went for, for a beer and a half. And um, uh, he did a five against five D zone thing with all five defenders with reverse sticks using the butt ends. It looked a little bit chaotic to me looking from the outside. I asked him afterwards, how did that go for you? Now, these are 14-year-old kids playing AAA. So they're pretty good, and it's a good team. And he's a great coach. He said, ah, some of it was good. Some of it was not so good. What wasn't good? A lot of kids didn't know what to do. Now, this is February, or it was February, with all those things thrown in there. Great coach, experienced coach, knowledgeable, open-minded. He did a half zone uh, inside the blue line, five on five. And about a third of those kids, from what I could see, maybe more of the of the ten, three or four, just no clue. Is he a Richard, coach? Too much information. But Rich, I'd like to I'd like to interrupt because I believe, and this is myself and my fifty years of experience, I get five on five play over in one minute, and then I get into what you're talking about. The claw four check is the one thing, and the claw is the same as a man on box behind in defensive cover. They learn to spread out to be first, second, or third to a situation within the framework of positioning. Done. And the kids get it better than teaching deliberate. Drills on the ice, just holding your hand up, steering with F1 one way and the other, and width and depth, read and act. End of story. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, we. I mean, we we've talked about that before, of course, Wally, and it and it's very applicable. We've also talked about before, or or I have. Uh, I think it's as simple as, and even with. The youngest kids you work with as coaches, hockey is about, yes, what's happening on the puck, but it's also very much about where is the puck going next? And it's as simple as getting the message into the kids' heads, even at six, seven, eight years old, hey, when you're on offense, Where's the puck going next? Try to be one of those people where it's going next and, you know, move to open space. And if you're defending, where's the puck going next? Try to deny one of those passing options where the puck's going next. 
And that very simple thought process and coaching technique, I think, can start to develop that balance and whole ice and player awareness five on five type mentality. Play a play a game with no rules except, hey, let's be aware when you're when your team has a puck, try to be an option for a pass. And are you gonna, you know, you can have the discussion, are you gonna be, are you gonna be open if you're standing right next to the player that has the puck? Are you maybe going to be in a better position if you're somewhere away from the puck and get the puck? And the same thing defensively. And it can be that simple. And there's zero structure, but we're developing an awareness in the players to look around a little bit, to move to open ice. And then you can obviously work in, hey, is it is it harder, is it harder to defend uh, when the one player has the puck? Or is it harder to defend when the puck goes from there to there to there to there? Which is harder to defend? And there are simple concepts that seven-year-olds can understand, I, I think. Um, and, I'm, 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 not, I'm not a minor coach, and I never have coached. So, you know, Mike's better equipped, and Dom and, and Richard, you're better equipped. But I think it's that simple at those young levels. Get that in their heads. It is. You're right. Uh, hence, we got to use the word hence more often. I think it's a really good word. Anyway, hence the case for small area games, three on three, four on four. That's why in the Pathways program, um, the kids are playing half ice at, you know, five, six, seven, eight years old. It's a smaller space. They don't have to think about as much, but the coach can give the right kind of instruction to, you know, what what are we doing here in this game? You know, the, I see those two players fighting for the puck over there. What are you doing? Where, where should you go? What do you think you can do to, to help each other out? Because in the same way we don't teach Macbeth in grade four, we have to get them being able to read a sentence, read a paragraph. Actually, maybe Macbeth, there's some elements of Macbeth that are really good that should be in grade four. But, you know, we, we progress from reading a sentence, reading a paragraph, reading a page, reading a, a graphic story, and then getting to a point where they can understand the nuance <laughs> goes on around them same thing in the sport like the mental acuity of these six seven eight nine ten year olds is just not there to be able to handle four and five players on a team there's just too much going on it's confusion okay and it's disorganized confusion so you're right yeah i absolutely i agree with you 100 percent, and we should be doing that but again we all know it the coaches don't know it who's going to show them Richard. Yeah. And Mike. Rick. Rick's up. Rick. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Rick. Thanks, Wally. Just uh, want to hitchhike on a couple of things that I've heard so far. Um, with this group that it, I'm working with uh, more so than not uh, this year, um, I introduced to them the idea because they were playing one on one hockey all over the rink. They're a U18, 18. They're pretty skilled kids. Some of them have fallen back from double ages for lack of positions. So, but I introduced to them George Kingston's 595 theory. Some of you may be aware of that, but for, on the idea that for all the time you're on the ice, you may have the puck by study 5% of that time. So in a 60-minute uh, game and three lines, you're on the ice for 20 minutes, you may have puck contact for one of those minutes. And the question is, what are you doing with the rest of that time? And I... I Talk to them about that. And then last night, one of the coaches mentioned uh, something about battling and the light bulb went off again. Um, how many battles are on the ice, fellas? We're always talking about battles, but it's usually around the puck. But in reality, there's four other battles going on. The four other skaters, goalies left out in this particular illustration, they're in a battle with somebody for ice, space, time, getting into a position of support, getting into a position defensively of supporting the defense, taking away a pass option, taking away a player. So you got to start thinking in those terms. And, and on the other side, earlier in the year, it, it, it came to me that these players are standing around watching the player with the puck, trying to figure out how they can fit in. 
And I started talking to them and to other coaches about getting those other four players to be drivers of the play, not the puck carrier. And by that, I mean, move yourself into a position, be available, be available to support. Support close, don't support halfway up the rink. The, just introducing these different thoughts into their heads to help explain things. And, and I've been coaching for 40 years like, like a lot of you, but the one last night was the first time I've ever really conceived it in that, in that, uh, that particular way, for what it's worth. Michael. Yeah, no, I, I mean, just, just piggybacking on all this, it's, just, it's the same as when, you know, I, what I try to do, with, or I, what I do do, is work with these, especially the younger coaches that want to get, you know, one of, the, one of the, the specialties that I'm in right now is just advising new skills coaches. Like, they want to make money. Okay, well, let's, let's put together a plan where you can make money and be in an ethical environment to teach. So one of the things we try to do is like this one-on-one, -on -one, you know, if you're working on a stride or working on, you know, a particular, very technical aspect of a player's game, it's great to be one-on-one -on -one in the corner working on those things. But when you're working on team play and co what coaches will appreciate more is I don't, every drill and every game and every structure we put the kids in, it doesn't always end in a, you know, jump over the border, jump over the border, jump over the border, spin, 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 shoot. Because it never happens. I mean, to, to your point, Rick, 5% of the time you have the puck in your stick and less than that, you're shooting the puck. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, so all the drills we try to put together for the kids is there's always an end game, but the other players aren't standing in line. They're, they're in the drill. Like if it's a, if it's a, if it's a three or four player to coach ratio, it's all about, okay, make the move. That's great. You know, make your little move, make your toe drag. That's it. You, you've made the play. And now there has to be options. Is it a pass? Is it a shot? Is it, is it, do you come back and regroup? Is it a, 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 you know, a pass up to the point? So what we try to do is put those situations in so when they get into a game, uh, they can react with not just the intention of, oh, I made a move, I'm shooting on the net, which never happens. They never get to do that. But maybe I can shoot and have some deception. I can shoot, have some delay. Uh, you know, I watch, listen, I watch, we, you know, we've talked about this many times on this show or on this call is the amount of, like the amount of times I watched what Marty St. Louis did before us in practice the last couple of years and exactly what he's doing with his current team. It's the exact same stuff. It's the exact same drills. It's the exact same games. It's the exact same concepts. They're just obviously at a, at a higher tick. Um, and they're probably done where he has to react and make them even more constraint based because the, the player is just smarter. They figure it out quicker. And I found that out when I was when I was working with the Connecticut whale and I was putting all these little constraint based games in the women were just so good that they would get it too quick and I have to go, OK, we got to come up with it. We got we got to make this constraint a little harder and the thought process a little quicker. And but again, that's the art of coaching. It's the the ability to see who you have and then react to it. But I think if we get away from the one on one beating a deviator and then walk, then sk skating down the ice. Now we're in a, we're in a much better place uh, to put ourselves in, in, in the situation that the kids are actually training in a game like environment. And I don't think we, de we definitely don't, even in our st small area station based drills, we don't do enough of that. Hence game like I got to uh, interrupt here and add, um, you said, figure it out. But let them figure it out. We don't. When I first coached, I didn't let them figure it out. It was all me. It was all direction. It was all telling. I didn't provide a framework within which they could think and make decisions. I told them what to do in situations. And I think the lesson I learned from a parent coach was he didn't have practices. He played games. And he patted him on the back and he looked for two things, effort and respect. So the concept of free play and the research on what is that in terms of enjoyment and thinking is is a key part 
and giving them a structure within which to position to start with and interchange relative to the game has yet to become a reality. We're still north-south. The pros are beginning to scissor from D to forward. But the game is still rudimentary compared to what it could become. So, Tim, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Wally. I, I, I was just going to sort of piggyback on um, on, on Rick's um, uh, 595 uh, George Kingston rule. And then as Mike was talking, it sort of occurred to me that it, it could be extrapolated not just from your general play, uh, like maybe you have the puck, I mean, 5% is probably generous, but uh, you maybe have the puck 5% of the time, might be in reality more like 1% or 2% of the time, but whatever it is. Um, and then when you get the puck, we probably also have a 595 situation where you might shoot the puck at the net 5% of the time, and the other 95% of the time that you actually touch the puck, you have to pass it, protect it, or stick handle with it. And this is all going to supporting what I, I know I missed last week, but supporting Al Andrews and our stick length thing. Everybody in the game now wants the big long stick because they can take the big shot and the hard snapper, when in reality, they get to use that skill so very, very precious little amount of the time they're they're playing the game. And they pass up better puck handling, better passing, better puck protection uh, by having a, a more appropriately sized stick, like from the chin down. So I just thought I'd interject that. So we've got the 595 and then the 595 under the 595 or under the 5. So it's the 595. Five five ninety five or something like that. <laughs> you guys are getting in the math now, so I got to leave. Yeah. But um, yeah. but, but it was great. Thanks, guys. Uh, Richard, nice hearing from you again. Awesome. Richard, uh, go ahead. We'll give you a ch chance to sort of summarize what you're doing and with all our thinking and bring things together because. Uh, I get so many responses from people at different levels of coaching, uh, university coaches, minor hockey coaches, and there's many minor hockey coaches that are really listening to our show and they're applying things. So Richard, the, go, go ahead. The, the, the purpose of my C presentation um is to get people thinking that uh there are better ways to teach our kids coming from people who have coached for years or taught for years or researched this for years on skill acquisition and whatnot we could argue till the cows come home on whether or not you should have pylons in the ice or don't have pylons in the ice but uh for the most for the most part, most coaches are doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, they get what they get. They'll have a good team if they have, you know, the right kids coming out. And they won't have a good team if they don't have the right kids coming out. You know, if you're in a small association, good luck. If you're in a large one, you have a better chance. Um, we can't compare what we do in minor hockey with what goes on uh, of, above minor hockey. It's it's a fool's game to uh, to do that. Um, so I feel that the onus is on us, and I'm taking it upon myself to try it out here, to um, to present coaches with some information, and then ask them, can you apply this? What do you? If you don't like something, what is your opinion based on? Is it based on emotion? Is it based on we've always done it this way? Is it based on the local junior coach says this, or I saw a presentation from a pro coach about this. And what are the commonalities between what you do with your 14 year olds and what that coach does with his pros? Honestly, and it's not just because I'm a Montreal fan, well, maybe there's a little bit of it, but 
We need more coaches in pro hockey like Martin St. Louis. He is an open blank canvas. He's coming from minor hockey with virtually no coaching background. Um, and the, now he may only last a couple of years, you know, two, three years, then they'll get tired of him like, like most pro coaches. But that approach he's taking of being open to new ideas and principles of not making the stock responses, that's wonderful. We should be taping everything he says, giving it to minor hockey coaches, go listen. Here's a guy coaching one of the most storied franchises in sport in the world. And, and he's open-minded about doing this and that. We need to be that way. We need to look at alternatives because what we've done is stayed, as in STAID stayed, and needs a little bit of a shakeup. Hence, no, oh, never mind. No hence. Richard, um, initially when you sent the form, you know, the email out, I really, the words S E E P, the letters, and how did you come up with that term? It seeped into his it's, brain it's one brilliant. day. It's, it's okay. truly brilliant. I had a revelation. The lights got brighter. We went from 40 watt to 80 watt. <clears> and houses. I just looked at what are the elements? I don't want to give coaches practice rules like you must do this and then you must do that and then you must do that i think the game is too i don't know if i'd use the word chaotic but uh, it's not as structured as basketball and baseball or, and coach centric we're gonna make it kid centric so i look what are the pieces and then i came up with elements and i don't want perfect practices i just want effective practices there's no such thing as a perfect practice we all know we've had some that sucked and some that just hummed um, so I just said, all right, well, I've got six elements here. I stole a couple of ideas from uh, Hockey USA because they, this guy, Zach Nowak, had actually five elements, but they were somewhat different. So uh, being an unabashed, you know, kleptomaniac, I stole a little bit from him and stole from here, stole from there, and came up with this genius acronym. Like, you have to admit, guys, I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Hence, uh, well, well, Rick, um, my biggest takeaway <coughs> is <clears throat> what you've done throughout the entire discussion. You've mastered the art when you work with coaches of questioning. And I, I wish I could do that better. But just the way you've talked about what you said, what you've asked of coaches about what they were doing, you've gotten responses from them that get results. Yes, Learning as a teacher, both of us are teachers. We do that every day. Yeah. Well, I I think I could have asked a lot more questions back in my day as teachers. <laughs> I was, a vice, I was a vice principal for a short while, and I, one of the questions I would ask of a teacher who was having a problem was, what were you thinking? <laughs> so there's that questioning as well. <clears throat> That's a good question. I'm writing that one down. <laughs> what were you thinking? <clears throat> I, got, I got asked that a lot as a player. <laughs> okay. I got I to gotta run, guys. It was really good. Uh, thanks, Richard. It was interesting. And like I said, we could, we could spend another session just talking about all this stuff. It's uh, really good. So okay. thanks. Thanks, Tim. Well, we're pretty good. We're at two hours, 23, 32 seconds. Um, not bad for a typical session. So, uh, Richard, I'm really glad you were able to get on from the get-go and listen while you had to look after the grandkids and then come, come back on. And I want to relate to you, Richard. <clears throat> the first time Daryl Belfry came on, this is a funny story. <laughs> you know, it was sort of like, oh, my God, we're getting Daryl Belfry. He's written a book. He's a famous name, and <clears throat> he knows and respects myself and Dave King from his era of being educated as a coach. 
That's why he came on. He had a personal respect for the teaching elements that we were providing about 50 years ago now. And so he joined us. And he was sort of like, uh, well, I don't know how long I can stay on. And uh, uh, but he, we, we got talking. And eventually, he started to contribute more and more, and he got very excited. And his ideas were so new, unique, um, a different way of saying things that made sense. And uh, he had to go for a COVID test. And he stayed on while in the car. After the COVID test, he came back, stayed on for another hour. And we managed to get him on three more times. So I think that's the nature of the beast here with our group. Um, the ideas of everybody sort of shared and thrown about uh, available for listeners to uh, take some things from. I know I got a hell of a lot out of this session. It was uh, amazing. So thank you very much, Richard. and. I'm not sure if Tom's going to stay on or not, but Tom, I'll see you at the game tonight at Crowchild. Looking forward to watching the playoffs and uh, st sitting with the parents. Yeah, your your voice, Tom. You've got your speaker off. What, was, what did you say, Tom? I said if the girls can stop the six foot guy that shoots like a man against our five foot goalie. <laughs> That's uh, whatever. Well, <clears throat> you know, I it's interesting how I I go into the games, just watching and enjoying them like no pressure whatsoever. Whether they win or lose, to me the it's a tie score. It's a great game. They got better. They had fun, but the the element of winning winning and how your ego is affected by whether you win or not validates your value and that's i think the biggest it doesn't matter if you win or lose wally why do we keep score yeah well it I mean, matters if, but if, it, if you win you were working for that so there's nothing wrong with wanting to win no, in fact, I changed the missing statement exercise to listing outcomes that you want to achieve. And I work backwards now. That's what I learned this year. You have to play to win. But if you're distracted from that process by your reaction to the, the game and the score at the time in the game, or from game to game, and the fact that, gee, you haven't won as many as you wished you would have, it may detract from your teaching and your coaching. That's that's my point, Tom. And oh, yeah. well, you're satisfied if your team plays good, but you're, you certainly are coaching the whole game to, to try to win it. Of course. There's no doubt about it. And you are not affected one iota by the things that occur within a game. Most coaches, and neither is Wes, his reaction to the score and that during games, post games. Now, everyone, both of you, after games, we get talking about why you didn't score, how, you know, how well you played. I just see so much improvement. I see nothing but winning having occurred. And if the parents are getting and this is what we need to prevent parents and coaches from not getting fixated on the purpose, but the process matters. And that's what it's all about. We've talked about the coaching process to lead to winning. And the definition of winning is being the best you can be. You can't control everything. So, all right. Uh, I've got lots of good editing to do, and uh, I really don't know where to start. Normally, 
I'll take my highlighter out and I'll sort of highlight, and I've got the minutes marked down in terms of who spoke and what they said. And I wasn't able to do that because I was too busy writing notes on that six pages here. So thanks very much, Richard. It's been very inspiring. Um, we wanted Daryl Belfry to come on because one time he uses the term, the student is a teacher in his book. And he was using questions with his players. And we were going to have him and actually do a presentation on questioning. The importance of questioning. Yeah, Dean is an expert at that. OK, well, let's possibly see if we can you talk to him. And see if we can get him to talk about that and the nuances. Yeah, I won't tell I won't tell him he's an expert on it, though, because it'll go right to his head. So. <clears throat> okay. All right. Well, that's something to look at down the future and something I would like to get better at. Get better. And uh, Peter, we're just about to close Peter. off, Peter. I just want to grab you real quick. Say hi. I had a great uh, lunch with my son. So I'm sorry I had a scoot there, but it's really good. It's really, uh, it's really great to have things that stimulate your thoughts, different opinions. And uh, at the end of the day, we're all about trying to make the game better, and that's a good thing. Hence why we're here. There okay. you go. All right. See you next week, guys. And, uh, Thanks, guys. Thanks, Wally. Take bye, care, bye. everybody. All right. Bye-bye.